Um, as far as I know, everybody got full credit on the trivia page itself. Um, I need to go back and double check some technicalities and stuff, but I think everybody was okay. Maybe, oh, there might have been one group that lost this for a height restriction thing. But anyway, oh, yeah. So, um, and there was one other group that had a height restriction issue, but then one out on creativity for having it. Anyway, so I'll talk to you. Um, okay, so, anyway, so most of you have, if not 50 points, very close to 50 points. Right? So now, the remaining chunk is the 100 points for the paper. All right, so you should be digging out your lab reports for first semester. You know, we haven't done as many lab reports as I would have liked, is what it is. Um, and looking back at comments, all right. Um, so it is a lab report. Some of this is going to be a little bit silly in terms of putting it into a lab report. But overall, the process, I think, still holds true. All right, so um, lab report should start with cover page. Background. All right, so the last lab we did, I don't know if you guys remember, it was the one where we had the carts on the tracks with the pulleys and a little weight pulled the cart down the track, right? So on that one, your background was intended to give a little bit of background regarding the purpose of the lab, which was to study Newton's second law, right? Okay? This time, we're not really studying one specific law, right? It's just about, like, can we get this trebuchet to work, all right? So in this is, instance, I think your background should be a little bit of history. It doesn't need to be a novel, but write me a few sentences or a paragraph about trebuchets. What they are, why they, where they, what they originated from, you know, whatever. Again, it doesn't need to be a novel, but just something to sort of draw the reader into the page, you know? Follow? All right. Purpose. What are you trying to answer? Well, you're trying to answer the question, can we launch a marshmallow, right? Uh, hypothesis, we think we'll be able to launch our marshmallow more than 50 centimeters, or however far you think it's going, all right? So that that's like bare bones minimum. And for 99% of you, I'm guessing that's what you're going to do. Somebody in my fourth hour said, well, can we do further experimentation? Can I modify my the mass of my counterbalance and see how that affects the range? A hundred percent, yes, please. Like that honestly was the original intent, but we ran a little tight on time and it is what it is, okay? So your hypothesis doesn't have to be a novel, it doesn't have to be anything mind blowing. It, it's a little bit silly for this setup, I get it. Yes? Um, do you have this handwritten? You have copy, a copy. Can I? I will give you a new copy. There's also piles and piles of them back there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I thought this was something at the beginning of the year. Oh, yeah. You've seen this in different forms a bunch of times um, as we've done different lab slides. Oh. Okay. All right. Materials. Just a bulleted list of stuff you use. Hot glue, popsicle sticks, a uh, pencil, uh, duct tape, whatever. Tools, literally all. All right, please, please, please. I, I think in the past I said it can be in paragraph or bulleted. The more I think about it, bulleted just what makes way more sense, right? Like if you're doing a recipe and you want to make brownies, you don't have to read through a paragraph to figure out what you need for the brownies. You just want a list, right? So you can store by your stuff, right? Yeah, so you want specific amounts of popsicle sticks or is it just popsicle sticks? Um, no, I don't think you need to be that specific there. Just, yeah, a rough list is fine. Yes? Um, for the purpose, um, like the question you can make, it can just be in the question form. That's fine, yeah. Just uh, this question can be in the form. Either way. Okay, everybody good up to there? You, you would have to really do something horrible to not get your points here. Like, these two easy points, right? You know, like, I'm not going to go for that with a fine free All right, so everybody good at that. All right, now, here's the bulk of it. Procedure. This is like, this is what I'm going to be reading, like, carefully. All right? So, down at the bottom, I'll remind you, this was an issue last time. As always, remember, the reader should be able to repeat your live using these procedures given the equipment. I ought to be able to give your paper to Mr. Pata, who is the science, the physics teacher over at North, and he ought to be able to say, oh, cool, and give it to his students, and they ought to be able to reproduce your experiment. Okay? So don't write it thinking, ah, oh, Hacker's going to know what I'm talking about, okay? Because I'm not your audience, okay? The audience is the, is the people who want to know about the research that you did. Make sense? Okay. So keep that in the back of your head. Also, as a quick reminder, your words, okay? All right. 
So I tend to see the procedure being broke up into um, two parts. So the procedure, I have maybe three parts, I guess, really. Um, so you're going to talk a little bit about construction, how you built the thing, right? Okay. And then the operation of it. And the operation itself has two chunks. There's the firing of the trebuchet, right? And then there's the projectile portion of the trebuchet. Make sense? All right. So the, am I saying that with weird emphasis? Um, so the procedure, you're going to outline those things. All right. Remember, the, the procedure is how you collect, how you perform the lab and how you collect that. OK? So um, you're going to discuss how you built it. You're going to discuss how measurements were made. Um, this is the portion where you'll probably have a drawing or a photograph of your trebuchet. All right, so that you can clearly explain how measurements were made. All right, the way that I envision this is, you know, you're going to have to make some drawings, right, or or have a photograph. So whatever, here's your trebuchet, right? So you might say, here's what our trebuchet looked like. Counterbalance, marshmallow. Okay. So you might say, here's what our counter our trebuchet looked like before it was fired. In order to calculate the gravitational potential energy, we needed to know the height of the counterbalance. And we needed to know the starting height of the marshmallow. You know what I mean? And show me how you measured stuff. We had to measure the length of our lever arm. There were two. One for the marshmallow, one for the counterbalance weight thing that I can't seem to remember the name of. Counterweight. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Now, whether you want to draw that or take a picture and draw on the picture or what, I don't care. But in some fashion, you need to make it clear to me how measurements were made. Okay? How did you, let me say one other thing and I'll get your question. How did you get your mass? Right? One of the things you need to get is the mass of this whole swinging structure thing, right? So did you assemble it, put it on a scale, and then attach it to the trebuchet? Or did you do it on the back end? Did you say, well, we used 10 popsicle sticks, and each popsicle stick is 2 grams, and so that's 20 grams. Or, you know, what did you do? Explain to me how you made your measurements. Okay? Yes? Uh, no, as long as you always use the same zero. A very good question. Very good question. Um, if it's going to become an issue, make sure you explain to the reader. You know what I mean? That, like if you measure from the base of your, like if you've got big wheels on it, and you measure from the base of your trebuchet, great, but just make sure that's plain, you know, that it's clear. Good? All right, now after the trebuchet fires, you're going to have a new drawing, right? Not over here. Right? And that's going to result in two more heights, right? A new height for your counter mass and a new height for your marshmallow. Or whatever. Make sense? Okay, so make sure you're detailed about how measurements were made. Um, yeah, what do you got here? Um, so I don't know if that does mean like in the other case, but I know that we have one that we never have like a constant height after it's grown. So I know like we like stop it somewhere to start it. Like where would we say the other heights were? What is your best guess to that? You guys understand what he's saying? He's saying that his arm kind of just goes like, well, like this, right? Isn't that what you're saying? Okay. That's what I would do. It's exactly what I would do. So yeah, if your arm sort of never stops, and then approximate the point at which you think the marshmallow exits the trebuchet, and that's the point you want to go to, right? Good. Now, keep in mind that where that happens, your your counterbalance might still have some gravitational potential energy, right? Like you're, it might still be falling. And yeah, that's part of the reason that I videoed it, was so I can kind of go back and check that kind of stuff. Cool? All right. So um, here are the measurements you should make. You should measure the mass of your counterweight, you know, the batteries or whatever, the mass of the throwing arm, the mass of the projectile. Ultimately, very frequently, you could get away with I don't want to say this. 
I guess just be mindful of the fact that the marshmallow doesn't have that much mass compared to the rest of the apparatus. Okay. All right. Um, you know, and then make sure you measure any important dimensions. We talked about that, heights, widths, lengths, anything like that. Um, and then finally the projectile. So once the marshmallow gets launched, I want to know some stuff like how far away from your trebuchet does it land? How far does it roll? Ultimately, where it lands is the important part. Where it rolls, eh, looks nice, right? Um, find a way to see if you can figure out how much time the projectile's in the air for. For extra awesome, just figure out how much time it takes for the apparatus to go. Some of that stuff is difficult. So some of it you might need to work backwards and calculate. Some of it you can try to measure with a stopwatch, and if you want to do that, cool, but just understand that's going to be a source of error, and that's fine. Um, another thing you can do is, is record it on slow-mo with your iPhone or your Samsung fancy phone, whatever, um, and then play it back. And I think that if you divide the time by eight, that'll give you the actual time. I believe that is how most of them are, because I think regular is 30 frames per second, and usually slow-mo is 240 frames per second. So when you play it back, I think you divide your time by eight, that gives you... Cool? All right. Um, questions about measurements? All right, so getting all of that is going to require you to do some runs and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, cool. And then, you know, make sure you read through all this stuff. How did you build it? What special things did you do when you built it? What, you know, what did you try first that didn't work? And how did you tweak it? You know, all that kind of stuff. Tell me about the process. All right. Questions on procedure? We're good? Okay. So I think that is that page. Do, do, do. Let's see, we talked about this. Um, all right, graphs and data. This, honestly, this section is going to be pretty minimal in your lab. I don't, un unless you're doing something extensive, like, comparing how the mass of the counterweight affects the range, I don't think you're really going to have any graphs. It's probably just largely going to be data, right, about, you know, we on our first trial at this far, on our second trial at this far. You know, maybe you'll have distance and time in the air or something, I don't know. Um, I guess that's it. I guess you could argue that the measurements you make is data, right? So that's where those pictures come in. All right, so everybody go to that. There's not a ton of data. It is what it is. All right, um, let's see. Oops. All right. Um, ba -ba 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 calculations. This is going to be the other big chunk. All right, so here's how I'm envisioning this. So at some point, you're going to calculate the rotational, uh, rotational inertia of your counterweight, okay? And in your paper, you might say, we calculated that the rotational inertia of our counterweight was blah, 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 blah. And then in parentheses, you should put C figure, or sorry, you should put C calculation number one. And then I ought to be able to flip to your calculation section, find calculation number one, and see how you got that. Does that make sense? Kind of like a, a bibliography or footnotes, endnotes, whatever they're called. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So here are the things you should calculate. You have done all of these calculations with one exception, and I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Okay? So we learned when we did angular momentum and not angular momentum, sorry, when we did uh, torque, we learned how to find rotational inertia, right? Like we learned that a disk was what, one half mr squared, and a hoop is mr squared, da, 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 right? Um, and then two of the things that were on there were the rotational inertia of a uniform rod about the center, and then there's one for a uniform rod about the end. Okay? But the problem is, most of your trebuchets, the uniform rod isn't pivoted at either the middle or the end, right? It's just some arbitrary spot in the middle, right? So how do we find the rotational inertia of that? So, those of you that take AP will eventually learn what's called the parallel axis theorem. So that's one way of doing it. Here's another way of doing it. Well, here comes. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to break it up into four things. Okay? 
you're going to have the rotational inertia of the marshmallow. Okay, I'll show you how to get that in a minute. The rotational inertia of the counterbalance thing, which I'll tell you how to get that in a minute. The rotational inertia of this half of the lever arm, and the rotational inertia of this half of the lever arm. Make sense? Right? Each chunk of the lever arm, so this chunk of the lever arm, can be treated. Can you see CJ? Can you see what I'm doing? So this chunk of the lever arm can be treated as a uniform rod pivoting around the end. So you'll just find the length of this, the mass of this end of it, and just do well, whatever it is, one third on L squared. Cool. I'm going to write it down right now. Okay. So here is what I'm talking about. All right, so pretend this is your target shape. I don't remember which way I drew this before. Marshmallow. Okay, so does my crappy drawing here make sense? Counterweight, marshmallow. Good? All right, so I'm going to color code. So the rotational inertia of the counterweight, well, basically that is of a point particle, right, because it's small compared to this distance, okay? So to find the rotational inertia of a what's called a point particle moving in a circle, it's just the mass of it times r squared. So let's call this distance here, let's call this L1, okay? So this would just be m times L1 squared. Good. All right. Now, similarly, the marshmallow, which I'm going to leave in black, so the rotational inertia of the marshmallow will be, oh, sorry, I should have put a CW here for counterweight. All right. So the rotational inertia of the marshmallow will be the mass of the marshmallow times L2 squared. So let me pause there for a minute. Does that, does that make sense? That's how you find the rotational inertia of the little counterweight thingy, whatever you have for your counterweight, and the rotational inertia of the marshmallow. Are there questions up to that? Good. All right. So now we need to deal with the arm. So that can be basically treated, it's probably oversimplifying, but that can basically be treated as a uniform rod with length L1, right? So here, my I is going to be, you know, this end of the rod is going to have some mass. Let's call it M1. So that's going to be uh, one third M1 times L1 squared. So that's the mass of the green end of my lever arm. Follow or no? Anybody confused? All right. And then we got to deal with this end of it. Well, that's going to have some other mass, right? We'll call that M2. So I for that is one third mass 2 times length 2 squared. Okay. So you've got four things that are rotating. Each of them have rotational inertia. That's how you calculate each of your four rotational inertias. What do you think you do with them all to get the total? Add them up, right? It's inertia. So in the same way that you can add masses, you can add rotational inertia. Because they're all pivoting about the same pivot point. So it all works out. No. For two reasons. One, mass can't be negative and L gets squared. Two, doesn't make sense to have negative inertia. Yes. Very good question. How do you go about finding the mass of one chunk? All right, so I've got this rod here. So presumably the person who constructed this found the mass of this thing. Okay. It looks like it's pretty much uniform thickness, right? So hypothetically, I'm going to make up some numbers here. Suppose that I knew the mass of this whole thing was 50 grams. Okay. 
Well, if I cut it in half, doesn't each half have a mass of 25 grams of it? Right? So I'd be able to use ratios. So if the whole thing is 50 centimeters and has a mass of 50 grams, then 30 centimeters would be 30 grams or whatever. Okay? Um, so and it'll have to be some approximating, and that's fine. Does that make sense or no? So ratios is the short answer to that. Cool? If you use popsicle sticks, just count how many popsicle sticks are this way, right? That's 4.3 popsicle sticks. This is 1.6 popsicle sticks, or whatever. Good? All right. Any questions about this? This is the only calculation that you're going to have to do that you've not done before. We haven't. This is the first time we've added rotational inertias. Are there any problems with it before I go on? You literally just add them up. Yep. All right. Now, what might end up happening, and I'm guessing will happen, one of these four numbers is going to be irrelevant. Which one? The one with the marshmallow, because it's got such a small mass, right? Okay. Which one do you think is going to be the biggest factor? The counterweight, right? Okay. What's up? It's not really. Yeah. So, and if you, you know, you might calculate it and then discover that it's so small that even adding it in doesn't make a difference. Then just tell me that. You know, we calculated the rotational inertia of the marshmallow, but it was so small that, you know. Sooner or later, though, you're going to have to worry about the marshmallow because that's the thing that is going to have kinetic energy, right? You know what I mean? All right. Yes. Yes, 100%. Everything should be metric. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you, you, I'll leave a scale up from everyone tomorrow or something. Kilograms. Everything. Kilograms, seconds, meters are the only units you should use. Well, and newtons and. Uh, Mark. Do you want to do the initial, initial? Yeah, that's where I'm headed. Oh. That's where I'm headed. Okay, so is everybody good with rotational inertia? All right, so going back to our list of calculations then. So, we talked about how to find the rotational inertia of the counterweight. We found the rotational inertia of the throwing arm. Total rotational inertia, just those added up. Why don't I need to worry about this part of the trajectory? Because it doesn't rotate, right? And hopefully it doesn't move at all, right? Okay, now, initial torque provided by counterweight. So, here's my, oh, uh, that's packet drawn. So, here's your trebuchet again. Oh, I know the one other thing I wanted to say real quick. Not all of you had a cup that held your, uh, held your marshmallow. Some of you had a sling. So you're going to have to just be kind of creative about how you deal with the rotational inertia, right? Because that, that means the distance that your marshmallow is from your pivot point is going to change, right? Sometimes, like, when you load it, the marshmallow might be here, right? But then it's going to swing up and out and get farther away, right? So we haven't learned enough for you guys to be able to effectively deal with that changing radius. That requires a bunch of calculus. Like, I don't even know that my AP students could do that. Um, so what I told somebody last hour was maybe take the average, like figure out what the closest radius is and what the farthest radius is and average them. That would be one solution. Um, the other option would be to go worst case scenario and just, pick, just use the biggest one. That would work. That would be, give you a conservative estimate, you know? Follow? All right. Okay, so, four, provided by counterweight. So here's the deal. So here's your setup. Here's your marshmallow. Here's your counterweight. Drop the blue again. Counterweight. Okay, so that's what produces the torque, right? Somebody name for me, what's the name of the force that provides the torque? Gravity. The force of gravity on the counterweight, right? Now remember, torque is R cross F. We may not have written it that way, but it became R times F times sine of theta, right? So R is going to be that distance, right? Right, the distance that the force is from our pivot point. The F is the force of gravity pulling it down. Now, here's what, I remember when we took this test, some of you guys were confused about theta, because we had two different kinds of theta. So here, what does theta represent? Say that again. 
Uh, no. Okay, so yeah, you guys, the angle is not how far it rotates. Okay, when you calculate torque, you're looking at the angle between the two vectors, in this case, r and f. So theta is this angle. It's the angle between your lever arm and your force. Remember, we had those problems where somebody was pushing a door by pushing it at a weird angle? That's this. It was the lawnmower handle. Remember, we pushed the lawnmower handle down? Same thing. So it's the angle between the vertical, because that's the direction of the force. It's the angle between that and the lever arm itself. All right. So somebody last in fourth hour right away was like, but wait a minute. The lever arm is going to move, so that angle is always changing, right? A hundred percent. And that's why in the instructions I ask you to find the initial torque. Because it's going to change, right? As that angle changes, your torque changes. So theta is between the horizontal and the vertical. It's between the vertical. vertical, I mean not the vertical. It's between the vertical and the lever arm. Good. All right, and then from here, the rest of this is all stuff you've done. So to find your initial angular acceleration, torque equals I alpha. We just found our torque, we just found our I, find your alpha. Cool? All of this is conservation of energy. All right, let me kind of walk you through that real quick. I have a drawing that I want to use. Okay, so in this drawing, we've got a lot of GPE in our counterweight and maybe a little bit of GPE in my marshmallow, right? When you release it, you lose a lot of GPE here. You gain a little KE here. And in exchange, the whole thing rotates. So in this drawing, we've got GPE of the counterweight. We've got GPE of the marshmallow, and that's it. So that's my total energy initially, right? Obviously, which of these two numbers is going to be the most significant? The counterweight, right? Because it's got more mass and more height, right? Are you good, Fred? Everybody good? All right. Now, over here, well, now my counterweight might have a little bit of GPE. My marshmallow definitely has some GPE, but still not that much because the mass isn't very big. And then where's the rest of my energy? Rotational kinetic energy of all four things, the two parts of the lever arm, the counterweight, and the marshmallow, right? What do those all have to add up to? The initial. So look. GPE, 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 that all depends on the height. So the only thing we're missing is this RKE. Which is the combination. That's the combination of all, the combination of both ends of the thing, the counterweight, ouch, and the marshmallow. So you add them all together. Yep. Well, no, I wouldn't even do that. It's, well, so we're going to know this value. We're going to know this value. And we're going to know this value. So to find this, what do we do, you guys? Subtract, right? Target, you good? All right. So then what you can do, now we've got the rotational kinetic energy of the trebuchet. So now we can find the angular velocity, right? Because I know RKE is 1 half I times omega squared. So solve for your omega. We know I. You just found the RKE. So now find your omega. Cool? All right. Um, now that RKE includes the, weirdly includes the kinetic energy, the projectile. So I guess at some point in here, you're going to have to use a jumper equation. There's, there, I, you know what? Let me say this. There's a couple ways to deal with these last two steps. I think I might leave it at that. Because there, there are legitimately a, a few valid ways you could do it. 
and they might give you different answers just because we're making some generalizations here, but they should be in the, in the same neighborhood, okay? So anyway, it's some, in some fashion, you need to find a way to find the kinetic energy of the marshmallow and the velocity of the marshmallow when it launches. All right, and there are a few ways to do it. Good? All right. Um, and then this is just using projectiles equations, so that should be big out the whole projectile equations. Remember, you separate your horizontal and your vertical motion. Good? All right. Now, there, it is very possible you'll have to make other calculations. You know, you might need to use some trig to find some distances, or you might need to, I don't know, whatever. There are other things you may need to calculate. And if you do need to, then great, show me that. Good? Questions? So I think the two biggest part, well, definitely the two biggest parts of your grades are going to be procedure and calculations. Good? All right. Finally, experimental sources of error. You're going to have a billion sources of error. Shut them out. What do you got? Air resistance on the marshmallow. Well, we have one. If you are doing that thing where, like, you have to find it where it launches, and then Estimating the release point. Is the source of error. Drupal, what do you got? Marshmallow position. Uh, oh, you got to be careful how you work that. Well, I, obviously, I'm not talking scientific. No, 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 I know, but. You know what I mean, though, when I'm saying on the thingy, because. We had the slang way, the slang like, so it was like, it could be different. Okay, so yes. So I guess what I want to make sure is that, like, suppose you've got a thing that looks like this. And that's what holds your teeny little marshmallow. You know what I mean? I guess, that, to me, that would be a thing that I would improve. Like, next time we would make it so that we could consistently place the marshmallow. Now, if you've got a sling, I agree that you, there's only so much control you have. I'm being fussy. You're right. That's totally good. Tell me to shut my face. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brad. What do you got? Uh, friction between, like, the axle and the uh, Yeah. There's friction, right? Somebody said mass of the glue and tape and stuff like that, right? A lot of you didn't take that into account. Fine. Theoretically, you should have, but it is what it is. All right, so there's a billion sources of error. Uh, estimating the radius of rotation if you've got a sling is a source of error. Um, I don't know. Good? All right, finally, your conclusion. Talk about the physics, OK? How did the principles of physics apply? Did your, <laughs> the easy thing is to just say if your hypothesis is true. Like, yep, it went 50 centimeters. Great, tell me why, okay? Analyze the physics, answer some of these questions. Some of you might find somehow that your trebuchet gained energy. Zuh? If that happens, tell me how. Like, why did that happen? That's a source of error. Figure out where it came from, okay? So say something smart about physics here. There's a bunch of ideas here to kind of get you thinking you in the right direction. I'm sorry? Uh, let me see. Um, no, I think you do need to answer all of these. Yeah. You, could, you made it sound like. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I think I was being a little too flippant. Okay. And then at the bottom it says notice there might be some overlap. You don't need to repeat yourself, but just make sure you hit, answer all the questions that are done. Good, you guys? You don't need anything. Here. All right. Helpful? Okay. Cool.